Okay, so what I want to do today is do a little demo and talk a little bit about character head shapes, okay, uh, for the intro to character design class. And what's really important about this, um, I had this discussion once with a student last, last term, and the purpose of this is I need you to think about shape language and how the shape, once you draw somebody's head, what I was just talking about to two students up here in the front, once you draw the shape of the face, the shape of the face usually communicates to what the feel and flow of the body might be. Does that make sense? So basically, it's just you experimenting with lots of shapes and trying to push your boundaries. And what do I mean by that? It's an important part of drawing is that we tend to be very safe as artists. We tend to only do what we want to do, and we tend not to want to push out because we're so afraid of failure. We're afraid to experiment. And that, in actuality, to become really good at something, you have to push out of your boundaries and look outside the box and try something new or different and see where that takes you. Okay, so before I start, I'm gonna sit here and start sketching in a minute. And before I do that, when it comes to faces, there's basically one answer that I might say don't do, and that would be this, is that you don't wanna do that because that is basically Charles Schultz and it's the peanuts. And the reason why I'm against that is that as young designers, you don't want to produce somebody else's work. And this has two things in common that are not attractive. It has what we call symmetry going from two different points of view. So um, in the world of perspective and drawing, we really have an X, Y, and a Z axes. So X is going um, across this way, okay? And then your Y is going up. And your Z is in depth, so that doesn't really apply to character design unless somebody's standing or we have more of a depth relationship with like a character and an animal. But for this part of our design, it's really important because what we want to try to do is we want to try to let me turn my touch part off. Hold on, technical difficulty. And my touch doesn't go on or off anymore. That's interesting. Okay, so what we want to do is avoid having characters that end up looking too symmetrical because it's it's somewhat boring. So one of the things that we want to do in our head shapes is we want to think about applying other shapes that allow us to get to another level. So one of the things that I love to do, the really the best way to do this, is to go out and look at other people around you, okay? So if I go out and I start looking at other people, I'm going to quietly look around the room and if I start seeing somebody's particular shape, I might notice that somebody has something ahead that might be a little bit taller and I find a way to quickly like distort it and see how I can pull that head shape up and around. And you see what I mean? I've gone taller now. I've I've changed the standard feel of that of that head ball. Okay. So whenever I do sketch, I always start with a basic sort of head ball. I like to throw a line down the middle because that line represents where the nose is going to be. And then if I throw another cross line, that represents where my eyes are going to be. And above my that line is always my eyebrows. And below that line are always going to be my cheekbones Okay, and, and the nose. So by doing this, it then allows me to come in here and figure out how I can really sort of like squash somebody's face. So here, I like to call this, I'm taking a circle, I'm sort of squashing it and bending it in. And to me, this is, it almost looks like an egg sort of, where I'm taking that face and I'm moving away from this. So I'm gonna call this our typical drawing. That's our typical sketch that I get from students, okay? This is also one of the reasons why I, not dislike, but why I don't want you drawing Japanese anime style. Because what is Japanese anime style, anyone? It's all the same. And it's human proportions exactly down to the T. There's no fun. There's no squash. There's no stretch. There's no distortion. And a huge part of character design derives from animators. And when animators would work on images, their responsibility was to get in and squash and stretch and to really play with head shapes, okay? So as I'm drawing, outside of throwing down these little lines, one of the, hold on, man, I'm having all kinds of issues right now with sketchbook acting up. 
keeps erasing things. See that? Oh, that's why touch is still on. Hold on. Let me just pause. I don't know. Okay, so sorry, I might have to go back in here. I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty with all of Sketchbook Pro right now. Where anytime I touch the screen, it's even my look at that one from pen to eraser, it keeps flipping back and forth. So um, anytime I touch the screen, the touch sensitivity on the monitor is not working, and I don't know why. So anyway, back to the head ball shape. So when I'm sketching a head shape, right, have fun with it. Just I like to think of random shapes that I wouldn't normally use. I like to start and find my center lines. And then once I get the shape in there, I like to really, it's important to me to have the neck on there. Because what does the neck do? The neck establishes the connection of the head back to the position of the body. And here's something also that the neck does. Okay, If I have a character that has a really super thick head, they might not have much of a neck. And if they don't have a neck, it allows me to figure out how the body of that character is gonna be. But I don't want you to be sketching bodies right now. I just want you to fill a page of different head shapes, avoiding the typical head that we see, avoiding the Charles M. Schultz heads. So if I did, you know, I did this sketch right here, even though I sketched in the body, I'm gonna take that out, okay? And then when we're done filling up a whole page of head shapes, I want you to come back in there and then put a layer or two on top and then start drawing pear shapes and looking at the difference. And, and I can just show you real quick before I even get to that. Look at the difference if I come over here and if I pretend this is like an old white guy, right? If he's an old white dude who's in the U.S. Marines, he might have a haircut that's like that because he has what we might call a jarhead style haircut, right? But... What if this is a young African-American kid and he's got a big fro and I might come in here and do that. You see the difference? So the hair totally inspires the overall shape and feel of what the character is in their background and a lot of times their ethnicity, their story, their life, their everything, their social economic background. That's huge. That ties into character design. If I add anything that deals with, with hair, it's going to instantly change the way, you know, the, the overall um, design of the character and what it feels like. Okay, so for right now, our goal is just to sit and have fun with these basic shapes. But when you start, I'm going to do my next four here with always starting. Sometimes I skip over the center, the, the, that center sphere because I'm always thinking about it in the back of my brain. So sometimes I just, I start with it, but then I think about it in the back of my head about, hey, what if somebody's head comes together and then they, they have no neck and they have a head shape like that. So even though I lightly sketch it, I'm still thinking about, hey, that's the center line, that's the eyebrow line, and then I bring the head in here and I have that head continue like that. And what's funny, do you guys know what body style that is, what head shape? That's Mr. Incredible. Mr. Incredible always sticks in my head for some reason, I don't know why, probably because it's such a nice design. So. If I get in and I start sketching somebody else, I try to go to the opposite. I try to think about maybe I have, take a triangular shape. What if I start with a triangle and up here where that upper sphere is, what if I triangle on top of that? So maybe I have a center line, but then I come in here and I put sort of angled shapes on that head and I see what I come up with. Okay, there's another head ball shape, see that? And then I'm gonna come over and start on another one. So my goal right now is to just finish as much work as I can. And notice this, when you put in this, this cross line, don't do this. Don't put an eye level right here. Why is that bad? That's right, it's the same distance from there as it is from there. That's not going to be interesting. What is going to be appealing on a character is if my eye level ends up being higher. So now I'm at 70-30. And by the way, right there, that term I just used is worth its weight in gold because not only does it apply to character design, it applies to environment design, it applies to composition, 
it applies to cinematography, it has to deal with com um, composing of light and shadows, 70-30. It's a golden rule of all of just general design. I don't want to learn more. Just get away from my screen. Stupid windows. 10. Okay, I got to say this right now as I'm drawing head shapes. Have you seen those dumb videos that Windows has where they're showing like an artist using like uh, the Surface Pro doing Maya and doing the dragon? I'm like, I'm watching that at home and I'm like, there's no way you could run that software on that computer and have it look like that. Because everyone I know that uses Windows 10 has had nothing but major issues and problems. Okay? So, anyway. Oh, I'm so frustrated right now, right now with Windows. So, look, take your shapes, push them, go for something different. If you do your first page of shapes, and if you're discovering that all your characters end up looking the same, you have to be willing to think about how you can you can manipulate and change somebody's shape. Look at all these beautiful organic shapes that exist with come on with sketching. These are really really important to get in there and to think about. And if you want to do a little bit of the neck, I'm totally fine with you bringing the, the neck over. Okay, so just get in there. What I'm going to do on my page right now? Go back to my lasso. I'm going to delete my typical. We know that's bad. Let's get rid of that right off the top. Now, something else you could do that could help you. If you get stuck on shapes, try stacking other shapes inside other shapes and have opposite shapes work together. What do I mean by that? What if I do this? What if I come in here? Uh, every time I touch it, I need to do a hard restart in a minute. See if that gives me back my controls of the sun case. Let's say I start here and I have a circle, okay? And by the way, notice how rough I'm being? If I see you doing this and you're like, uh, and you're doing this solid line, I'm gonna take a ruler and slap you in the hand, okay? Or get that dog collar from Home Depot. That'll work. Just have fun, be loose, be rough. Part of drawing is not committing to lines, it's being gestural with what you're doing. So here, look, I'm taking a shape. Now, what if I decide to push that forehead shape to like in a trapezoid? And then I come down here, and then I come down and I'm imagining my guy, as soon as I bring a line down like this, I'm imagining him being maybe a little heavy set. Maybe he's got a what we call like a goiter, like a secondary neck. So I bring that back down in, and then I come back here and I drop that line down. Do you see how cool that head shape is? That's not something that's going to be typical that you're going to find. Now I can put that body, just bring the neck down a little bit. Can you imagine if I told you now, just looking at the shape language that I have here? Oh my God. I just so frustrated. Um, look, and then I flip it over and then it goes back to eraser. Sketchbook doesn't know what it wants to do. If I had to say, there's a character named Chunk that eats a lot of Oreos, what shape is it going to be? going to be the one I just did. This guy right here. That's Chunk. Right? By the way, he's one of the characters in Goonies. Okay? So, what if I said I have a guy named Alvin and Alvin is doesn't have a lot of friends and he's got some social issues and he doesn't like to go outside and talk to people. I know. I'm just throwing it out there. This might be more Alvin. This one here. Or maybe this one here. Right? Maybe Alvin... Maybe Alvin in the script is really tall and skinny. So he doesn't like, look like Alvin the chipmunk. So if that helps you to think of your shape, then do it. Then I'm going to come in here. I'm going to start with a, a head ball. And I'm going to give my character a very long, skinny face. And I'm going to bring it up here like this. Look at that. Look at the sway of that neck. And then maybe I bring that sway down into his body. You see how that head shape can work? Okay. Now, I know that looks like a one eye in there, but it's not. That just was my head ball shape. There, that's that shape for there. So, this is your goal. Eric, do you have any other questions on this? Try to avoid similar shapes and have fun with it. I mean, just um, push yourself to do different things. I like comboing shapes and I like thinking of things. For example, 
I think of the guy. I have a guy that lives across the street from me. He doesn't talk to anybody. And he's an old guy with gray hair, and he likes planting palm trees. And one day I saw him out planting a palm tree, and I realized this is what his head shape was. And he's an older dude, and I realized his hair looks like a palm tree. No wonder why he likes planting palm trees, because his head looks like a giant palm tree. <laughs> okay, it does. It has, and he's older dude. He's it got gray hair, and his hair comes off to the side. Okay, and then here's another neighbor of mine, and I'm not making this up. He's got a beard the size of Alabama. He's got a beard that hangs off his face like this. And when you see him, he's all beard. Okay? That's an interesting neighborhood. And, oh, I have a whole bunch of great ones. And he has no upper hair on his head. So he's all beard, and his ears pop out like little radar dishes. That's his shape. Okay? So, Sometimes I find it easier for people to think about shapes of a particular individual. If you have a hard time throwing shapes down out of your memory, then you have to go back and think about people you know. And boy, that's fun to do that because I could just go to town. Here's my buddy Dave. Dave, if you're watching this, too bad. <laughs> Dave has a really skinny neck. And he has the largest Adam's apple you've ever seen. Like pop out of his neck. And voice match. Huh? Voice match the Adam's apple. I don't okay, the voice is even weird because Dave moved to Texas now and now when I talk to him he talks like a Texan. Uh -huh. He's like a Southern California guy that used to be like, No way, bro, it's like totally cool. And now I talk to him and he's like, Well it's all it's all it's different out here in Texas. Uh -huh. And I'm like, Why do you talk like that? You sound like you're in a Western movie, you know? And Dave has, you ready? His hair is Flock of Seagulls. You know the band from the 80s? His hair is literally like this. It protrudes off of his head and gives him this weird shape and he has this long face shape. Okay? Like so. And he's the only human being I've ever known in seventh grade had a full hair of chest, a chest hair. He was like two and a half inches thick, permeating out of his shirt. And then we all bought him like bought him like electric razor for his birthday. And we'd never in seventh grade, like we hadn't even most of us didn't even hit puberty yet, right? And Dave's walking around with like this thing of chest hair like Magnum, you know? Like Tom Selleck. If you guys don't know who Magnum is, right? Okay? So think about people that you know. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this in, in a good way, if possible. Look at nationalities of people. Everybody has a different body style and a body shape. We haven't talked about body shapes. Pear shapes, round shapes. Remember, your head shape influences part of your body shape, right? Okay? Think about that. So... Um, here's one for you. I got a dude up the street. Now, I understand the difference. He is... He has a turban. And it's really sad because there are people that'll be like, oh, that dude's a Muslim or whatever. And I'm like, he's from India, you knucklehead. It's not even... It's like you can't even tell the difference because you're so you're living on an island called the United States and you've never been out of it, never seen anybody else in this world. That's what his face is like. And I know he's, now, however, though, there's a difference. In India, you do have like three different variations of people and you do have Indians that are Hindu and you also have Indians that might be Muslim that are also next to Pakistan, and then you have, so there's, there's other variants, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just trying to incorporate 
styles that I see when I see people wearing. That's what his head shape is. So what one of my jobs is, I can't talk today. What your job is and what my job is as an artist is to notice these things, okay? I have a buddy of mine, this is his face. He has the biggest cowlick. So you know what a cowlick is? Yeah, cowlick is the side of a guy's head receding. And he has a land, he has his ears are like this, and his cowlicks are like this, and he has a landing pad in the middle. Like that. That's his detail on his head shape. So can you notice where I'm pulling a lot of my head shapes from? I'm pulling them from things I see and things I know. Okay? So if you don't get out of the house that often or you can't look around at other people, that's an important part of, of us sketching. In fact, if you want to, we haven't talked about, I gave you guys body styles, right? Maybe we should go out in the quad next week and draw people. I would love to do that. I have pages in my sketchbook of doing that. That is worth its weight in gold. And why is that so important, folks? Because there's so many different looking people in this world. It is absolutely fascinating to learn and memorize part of their shapes and get an understanding on how they look and feel. And um, sorry, my tablet's not working. Now, um, you might look at my face shapes, they might feel more male, right? I can instantly turn any of those shapes into female based off of what? That's right. If I come to this character right here and I do that, that's now a girl with big blocky hair, right? And then if I think of one of my daughter's friends that comes over and she's got like magical ponytails that defy gravity and then they hang them down like that, that's that, right? See that? She does. So I need to think about these little details and if that isn't a girl and if it's my brother's, my brother, I can't talk. Um, if it's my son's friend, Aiden, who we call Adon, his hair is like, like a landing pad, like this. See the difference? So the hairstyles, that's why hairstyles are so important, why I wanted to incorporate that into this assignment, is that the hairstyle is going to dictate, for the most part, a lot of times, part of the gender and background and even can dictate the racial, ethnic background of a character, right? Absolutely it can. How did I change colors? I'm sorry, I'm having technical issues today with this software. And right when you think you're out of space, you better squeeze a head shape in there. In fact, what you'll start to learn is you can do some really cool things having to draw in head shapes that you might not have thought about before by having to squeeze them into a particular location. Can you see that lower jaw on a guy being an old man with a cigar or with a pipe hanging out? Do you see that? Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, I do apologize. I have not given the character design class um, the demo yet on silhouette shapes. I'm gonna work on that and when I come back on Monday I'm gonna give you guys that lecture and I'm gonna cover that because understanding silhouettes, visual reads, and shape language, I, did, I haven't given that to that this class, have I? This is why I'm not gonna teach five classes again. There's too much going on and happening. Um, another thing to do with shapes, play opposites. So look, if I have somebody that's got what I call a pan face, which is a straight face, 
maybe a little nose. And then maybe the back of the head is extremely round. See that? Play opposites together. See what comes of that. Curve against the straight. And maybe I do the opposite. Maybe the back of the head is really straight. And maybe the head is extremely round like this. Different shape. should have no leftover white space inside your image. And what you're going to soon realize, and it's cool to hear other people talk about this, is the head shape that you might not like or think is the most boring on a character always tends to be the one that an art director or somebody else really really likes because you get used to your own drawing style you get used to your own rhythm does that make sense and then you do something that's different that people haven't seen and all of a sudden they're like "Ooh, that's it that's cool i haven't seen that before i really like that shape So here I'm going to take off my neighbor's crazy hair and keep back to the shape. And one last thing, how I'm 20 minutes into this demo. This is my first page. What does that mean? It's the worst page. It's my worst page. That's right. If I go back over this, even though I'm only asking you to do one, if I go back over this and start doing more. Um, I'm going to have better results. I'm going to get more fluid. It's part of my design, my sensibilities, and the way I'm looking and addressing the reads. And I'm going to come up with some really cool end results because of that. All right. Remember how important the neck is. You see what I'm doing in almost every one of my shapes? The neck is an extremely important part that relates to the head ball because you know what's funny? It's what we're just talking about up front here is um, the head ball shape, once you nail the head, it really translates and moves you. It flows you in like a line and rhythm and action into the shape of the character, correct? 
make sense? So once you get these particular shapes moving, it really gives you an idea of the gesture. So you'll notice sometimes I even do this, like right here, let me do this one here. You'll notice me sketch a light line. That's like a line of action in me that represents part of the spine. And then I wrap a head ball to that shape. And then I come over and I figure out what kind of, of element or distorted shape that I want to give to my character. huge, very important part. You already don't like this because look, the face is equal height as the turban. So what I'm gonna do is really make that turban large. short face, little beard. All right, so there we go. What I'm gonna do, that's my first page. I'm at 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I'm gonna throw some tone under there, very light gray, just to make them pop off the page. And, and then that'll be it, and I'm done. So that was what, that's the direction I want you to go into. Um, I'm gonna write down, I'm gonna make sure I talk about shape language with you guys, because I, I apologize, I haven't done that yet, and I was supposed to do that, and I have a lecture I'll put together for that. So I will bring that for the next class. And um, maybe then after we go over that lecture, maybe we can step outside and draw some people real quick. Sound cool? Yes. For Monday? Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay, there's one thing I wanted to put in here that I didn't mention that I need to mention really quickly. And when you're doing your face studies, you can put ears in. Okay? So here's one thing to remember. When you're sketching, well, first thing, I just had a, a great question from Connie. We were talking about this. If you already did your head shapes and they're very proportional, don't worry about that. That's still acceptable because a lot of times what we do, one of our jobs in animation is having the ability to work on top of existing sketches and drawings that we've done. It's to get out our ideas and build on top. No one comes out and draws a perfect elephant or a perfect character. You build that up over design and that's a huge part of the way I teach is, is you guys will see after we've been doing these base exercises, is we do silhouettes, we do studies, we take a character, we push it, we do another page of variations, then we do another page of variations, and then that leads us to our final outcome, which is much better, okay? What we don't wanna do is get stuck in something, okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention. So that means everything is a stepping stone. Everything that we do is a transition. There are no bad drawings. There are only drawings that lead to better drawings. So if you go around and knock yourself like, oh man, my drawing sucks and I suck, you are preventing yourself from getting better because of a belief system. But if you have the other belief system, which is if I do one drawing, that's gonna get me to another one, and then I keep working on it and I keep raising that plateau, you go from A, B to C to D to F, and all of a sudden a G, you hit it and you have a bitchin' character. That's the reality of how people draw. So that was my first point. Thanks, Connie, for asking me about that. So this whole page I did here, even though my second might be better, this is still a stepping stone for me, right? Right, okay. And here's the other thing I wanted to mention. Let me put another layer on this. If, if you sketch in ears, okay? The ear position is directly related to the eyes. And if you do it a little bit different, the character can look funny or distorted, but that's up to you if you wanna change it. So what do I mean by that? If I throw the eyes here, look at me standing right here, and if I take my finger and drag it to the corner of my eye, and if I drag it right across, the corner, the top of your eye hits the top of your ear, which means that's sort of a, a given for me. So if I have the eyes up really high, 
I know my character's ear is going to be about there. Does that make sense? Okay. Because then if I come back, and if I decide, maybe I put, this is like how Megamind was in, from DreamWorks, the, the eye line's really low, and this character has a huge forehead, and then you see where the ears are there now? Now they're, that actually reminds me of one of the characters from, um, what's the thing Sony did with the vampires and all that stuff? Anyway. Huh? Tra Hotel Transylvania, they did that a lot with some of the characters where they dropped, gave them real bi really big foreheads, okay? So do you see the change over there? Now what you don't want to do, and this is where it looks funny, if that's my eye line, that doesn't look right. You, you instantly see it and the brain matches up because br your little microcomputer goes, that is absolutely incorrect. There's no way the ears could be that high. Okay, so, um, and then you could try different versions on a character and you can even do this if you like as an overlay. Why is it not doing anymore? Hold on. There it goes. Okay, so um, what if I did this? What if I have my character line, my eye line up really high, and then I throw the ears in down there? Sometimes that might work a little bit, but it looks dysfunctional a little bit. The way you can make that work is if the character has some really funky hairstyle, like this, it comes up and covers part of that. Does that make sense? Then, do you question it as much right now? No. That's one way I personally found that you can make it work. But, remember, you all have that little microcomputer. And it's the way we analyze things. It's all the images we've looked at. It's all the films that we've seen. It's all this information that we've always brought in that we re relay back into our designs. That's why it's extremely important for you guys to be looking at people, to be drawing from life. That's why it's important for you to be on Pinterest and to have files selected of artists that you like. In fact, just to mention this one last thing and I'll wrap this up, okay? Every artist that came before you, the European masters, the American illustrators, okay? They were responsible when they were young students. Remember, everybody starts somewhere. They had to mimic other artist styles. Everybody did it. So it is in your best interest to find people that you like. I've already told you guys some of my favorites. I love Creature Box. I love Sergio Pablo. Um, I love Sandro Cluzo. I love, there's a bunch of, I love Milk Call. I mean, yeah, I tend to go to one particular direction, but then there's also a little graphic, some people that do very graphic styles. Nico Marley. I love looking at these designers because I can look at them and see how they make shapes, and then I put that away, and then when I do Phil's design, I create my, nose, my own style based off of the influences from other artists. That's not cheating. That's a form of mimicking. And guess what? All the great painters mimicked other painters, all the American. In fact, when you went to the Brandywine School, which was the school that on the East Coast of the United States that the American illustrators went to, guess what they had to do? They had to copy each other. N.C. Wyeth had to go copy Howard Pyle. He had to look at his paintings, his styles, and he learned from him, and then he became, he went down his own path. In fact, a huge part of what an artist would do in their early 20s was copying and mimicking and having a mentor, somebody whose work you could look at, that you could derive from. So if you don't have, you guys are lucky to have the greatest thing ever since sliced toast, which is Pinterest, okay? Because you talk about laziness. When I was your guys' age, we didn't even have Google. You now have Pinterest where you can look at, Pinterest is a search engine that groups all these images together, allows you to pin it, make your own custom folders and they don't even charge you for it. If they charged me $5.99, I would still pay that a month just to have the ease and access to have, and, and by the way, I go to Pinterest all the time and I grab images off just to have my own folder for collections, for reference, to know what it is I'm building or know my subject matter, okay? All right, cool, you're free to go. Thanks, Connie. That was a great question uh, that needed to be addressed. So here's the very end. I always go back. I put a little bit of value underneath just to help see the silhouette, and you can still see the gesture of the sketch, and it all comes together. Have fun and keep on drawing. Thanks, guys.